All right, y'all, here we go. So those of you that have clicked on this and are like, this isn't the traditional alchemy cinematic playoff preview of the finals, right? Well, one, I'm tired of previewing the Cavaliers and Warriors finals. And two, I'll be perfectly honest with you, those of you that have been paying attention, I said the Celtics were coming out. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, I had prepped a little bit for the Celtics preview. And then as the series extended and it went to seven and it didn't happen, it kind of left me in a bind here with about 36 hours to do a preview. So I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone. I got my boy James with me. Those of you that have watched our podcast, That NBA Life. So this is just a finals preview of that. It's a little different format, but a way for me to give you my take. James give you his take on this this matchup that's coming at us hot and heavy in like two days, 48 hours. Uh, what's good, James? Nothing much, man. I was kind of feeling for you for certain sections of that last game. I know emotions can be kind of connected and kind of high whenever you watch a team come out a little sluggish and have a little bit of challenge at the beginning state. So, yeah, my heart was out there for all you guys, Warriors fans. It was a little bit tough, but they kind of weathered the storm. What was it that you were seeing? I, I kind of indicated some challenges with uh, the turnovers, but that's, you know, a mute point. Everybody's talking about that. But, but what did you see? Yeah, it was. Hey, this has been such a learning experience for me year two, man, of doing, you know, like covering this, like as a media member and stuff. And um, one, I, I jump to conclusions way too fast. I get I get so I get so mad at a, like a certain play that it like it, it, it carries on for like five minutes into the game. And I'm just mm -hmm. like steaming about something. But um, <laughs> but I think I think that the, the turnovers one. I want to say the turnovers will always be a part of this offense just because it, it it's like I've said this before, but it's just true, man. Math, like the volume of passes, there's going to be turnovers. But I thought Draymond and I was on Twitter, you know, cursing about this Draymond, his lack of confidence offensively has guys sitting on the passes. And so I thought there, that that was that. But. I think that ultimately we can talk. It's funny because everybody today, the storyline is, oh, how, you know, one, they want to talk about the refs. And I'm not really willing to play that game considering how the Rockets play every mm -hmm. game. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, and yeah, there was, there was some missed calls, but we can go back and point them out all through the series different ways. But I just thought it was funny how the people that are criticizing Houston saying, well, why did they, why, why did they keep shooting threes when they were missing? <clears throat> right? And mm -hmm. to me... If you're tired, you're done, you've got nothing left in the tank, what do you do? You settle for shots, right? For yes. perimeter shots. So they, the people that are saying they should have got off the three-point line, they were spent. That's the only option they had. Do you think they're going to drive to the basket and, and get dunks yes. when they're tired? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, this is not 2K, and although it is relatively realistic and you can re-up your energy at a certain point, <laughs> you can, as a grown man, you and your legs are tired, ankles are tired, calves are tired, you've been playing, you're giving it your all, you know, you, you hesitate when you think about how much energy it's going to take to cross up, get across the screen, get to the middle. That's a lot of thinking. And as you know, in basketball, you don't want to be thinking too much. You want to just be reacting. But if your body can no longer react, you're right. You you are settling for shots. And we were kind of discussing that before you were talking about the long step back as opposed to a lazy step back. And I, and I was looking at it more critically. And you're correct. It takes legs to do it, not necessarily properly, but one style of it. You really do have to get the legs engaged to get it to get it happening in rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I know for me and like particularly if I'm fatigued, I don't have it when I go plant hard off the right leg. When I decline into it to bounce out, I just don't have the same pop to it. But, you know, ultimately, I think that and we'll move on to this finals preview here in a second. I think that the, the Rockets, the cost and, and I, I've probably said this, I've been talking about this all day. I probably said this three or four different places. But the, you say, how did how did Ariza and Tucker, you know, put the clampers on KD? And he shot like almost 30 percent, 32 percent for most of the series. And how are they so well? Their effort level was at 10 every minute they were on the floor. Mm -hmm. Right. And we've seen like LeBron has showed us that it, LeBron played 48 minutes, but he's not playing hard all those 48 minutes. And we'll get into this. Right. But there's times where he literally just stands there. I mean, did you see when he got the block on um, Rozier? Mm -hmm. And I know it was kind of mm -hmm. like a, a statement, but he stood under the basket for like the whole rest of the possession. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so yeah. there's trips he doesn't even make down the floor. Mm -hmm. And with Ariza and Tucker in particular, 
they were at maximum effort the entire series. And what you saw was the cost of that in the second half of that game seven, man. Mm -hmm. Um, but moving forward into this f four, fourth time, I, I don't even know the term of it. Someone had said it to me. But the fourth matchup here, I think the story is Iguodala and his health. Mm -hmm. Kevin Love, what is he in concussion protocol? I still think that that was funny business. I know he's had – I have no proof of this. But my, well, my point was there's ways around concussion protocol. Mm -hmm. So I know that – I know that Kevin Love has had concussion problems in the past, but I just I just think uh, I don't know. I guess it's just a judgment call. I'll put it to you like this: I think if Kevin Love wanted to play, he he would have been allowed to play. The Cavs mm -hmm. would have found a way for him to play. So mm -hmm. Kevin Love and I respect that. I'm not judging him. If that if he really did, did have symptoms and it was really a safety thing, then so be it. But I'm just saying that we've seen I've seen football players. I know that's a different sport, but I've seen guys wake up on the field, get up, and say they're good. Mm -hmm. And they kind of get brushed by and continue the game. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I, I'll say this right now, and I don't know anything other than what anybody else has been saying. The fact, second opinions in sports is like the kiss of death almost, right, with mm -hmm. an injury. Mm -hmm. And Iguodala went and got a second opinion on the knee. And so mm -hmm. I, I'm not expecting Iguodala to, to contribute in this series. And so that makes this thing a little more interesting, right? And for, I think what it does is, if Iguodala does play and is effective, I think it forces Cleveland to play small ball, right, against yes. the traditional death lineup. Mm -hmm. But if he's a no-go, if you look at the Warriors' depth, all of a sudden we may see traditional big men reinfused into these playoffs. That will be interesting. They were talking about how if Love is not there, they'll need to make some adjustments and maybe utilize the current standing that they have. That that definitely would be a different look. Uh, with Green coming in, um, I don't know, he, he's a little bit more spry, a bit less of a defensive liability. I think Draymond's going to definitely do his thing regardless of who's down there. But interesting story about Green. I, I wasn't aware of it, but he had a heart condition, and he's thankful to even be playing basketball to this day. So outside of what happens in the, the finals, good, good job for Green to be able to play basketball again. He had this aneurysm in his heart. It's kind of an interesting story. But, yeah, they, they will have to make some adjustments down low. Yeah. Uh, so Jeff Green was a rookie with Kevin Durant on the Seattle Supersonics. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to draw the assignment of Kevin Durant. And you're right, he is a better defensive, defensive player. There's a familiarity, and that works both ways. Like, I'm sure Jeff knows some of KD's tendencies, but mm -hmm. KD also probably feels very comfortable playing against Jeff Green and mm -hmm. knows what he can and can't do. Now, Kevin Love, the co concussion protocol, from what I understand, he's questionable for he may miss game one. But we know we're going to see Kevin Love in this series. We don't know if we're going to see Andre Iguodala in the series, to be honest with you. And so that's a bigger question mark now. Um, I've rec and, and I'm not going to go super into detail of these matchups because we know we we know most of these. I know there's like the new faces for for Cleveland, but it's not really about them. I think that here here's the, here's the ultimate question to this series. We've seen LeBron rest. The strategy for the Cavs has been LeBron kind of chills out, plays free safety on defense. Right? He didn't guard Oladipo. Mm -hmm. He didn't guard. He hasn't throughout the series is he hasn't guarded the main offensive weapon. Right. Because that's where he needs to chill. He's playing like the whole game. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he has to carry the load offensively. I think that ultimately I looked back and forth at these matchups and trying to guess the lineups is very difficult because of the inconsistency of the Cavs rotation. Mm -hmm. But I think that ultimately LeBron has to nut up and guard Durant. Mm. And I say that because I think that. That's the only way Kevin Love can ultimately stay on the floor, you know, because otherwise you're you're gonna you're, he, he's just gonna be a defensive liability. You're, if you look at the lineup at what Golden State's gonna push out and force Cleveland to defend, yes, you know, you know what I'm saying. And so I think yeah, definitely, Le, I think Le, I think LeBron's going to have to uh, he's gonna have to it's almost gonna have to be a reverse strategy. I think mm. Cleveland's only chance in this series is if LeBron's like all right. KD, we've heard you say you're number two and you want the crown and all this. I'm taking you out of this series. And that it still may not be enough, but I'm just saying strategically, I feel like that's almost their only chance. And then he would have to pray 
that Kevin Love could, you know, drop 30 a night. J.R. Smith could, could you know, they, he's going to need that. He's going to have to hope the offense can be picked up from somebody else, and he's going to have to lock down on defense. Does he even have the juice left, man? Yeah, they're definitely piecemealing things together. I, I was reading an article, and it basically described it the way you were saying. Love's lack of quickness really undercuts his want to. He may have a great desire to play, but his sheer lack of quickness definitely makes it to where Ty Lue has to have Tristan Thompson come over and help him a lot, and that tends to create gaps in the defense that can easily be exploited. You saw that in the Celtics series that you're having people playing double duty and every man needs to be solid for himself, especially during this critical time. And Lou was kind of saying, well, with love out or adjustments that we make, that means more time for some other guys to come in and potentially um, add some stuff. But if Jordan Clarkston and some of these other supportive players don't come in and subdivide that time appropriately, then it's, it's a loss for everybody. And in relationship to the points or actually how bodies work, I was just thinking LeBron really exceeds from the standpoint that his body works in a different capacity than others do, while the Warriors simply have a higher level of skill. So you, when people are talking about a David versus Goliath concept, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. But um, you could coin this one as a David versus Goliath. But I tend to think of it from the terms of the Lion King. Remember those three hyenas that were trying to get Mufasa or whatever it is? Scar, Scar's little pack? Yeah, Yeah, you feel me? So I just kind of feel like even we, though we love the Warriors, they've been kind of vilified more recently. So if you think about their three kings, that might be them trying to take down Mufasa or whatever, and they have to go get Scar to, to make it happen. So it's just kind of a funny illusion, but... There, there might be some um, credit to it. But we'll, we'll, I'm definitely excited to see whatever it is. I hope that it, they don't just get dusted. You know, I am a Warriors fan, but I do want to see some competition. I, I'd like to see it be a little bit back and forth. But if they do get the word, you know, that really speaks to the testament of how strong the Warriors truthfully are. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think they opened up as the greatest favorite in NBA Finals history in Vegas, mm -hmm. like as soon as the Rocket Series was over. Mm -hmm. And that's dangerous, right? We've seen we've seen the Warriors' arrogance has really reached an all-time high. And you talked about them being vilified, and I think that that has taken some of the joy out of the culture around the team. Mm -hmm. And it takes the energy away from them as well. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, back to this whole LeBron has to guard Durant for them to have any chance. And let me elaborate a little more on that, because ultimately the only advantage I see Cleveland having is, is size and rebounding. And that's mm -hmm. between LeBron, Kevin Love, and Tristan Thompson, mm -hmm. right? And if in in this, we've seen these teams play so many times, and in the games where if one the only the only time they would win is if one they went absolutely crazy from three point range, or two it was one of those games where they just destroyed the Warriors on the glass. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to play Love and Tristan enough, LeBron again is going to have to guard KD because I know Tristan moves well on the perimeter. He can't guard KD. And again, Kevin Love can't guard KD. So you'd slide LeBron to the three, and then you've got four or five Tristan Thompson. And I think that's their real shot with size. I, I do think that Tyron Lu is willing to try things, right? That he, he I'll give him mm -hmm. that credit. People say he doesn't get enough credit and all this stuff, but mm -hmm. he is definitely not afraid to like shuffle things up. A couple mm -hmm. things that I would look for is one Jordan Clarkson. I would cut him. I would put. I know Rodney Hood's had some issues with, like, uh, personality issues. I don't know what it is. He refused to go back in the game. It gave him the Pippen treatment. Whatever it was, <laughs> Rodney Hood fits this series better than Jordan Clarkson does. Jordan Clarkson kind of has just this. Uh, he has like a spectrum rhythm. When he when he's on the court, man, and it's and, it, and it's just it's just off putting. It breaks the flow of the offense. His irrational confidence, and he's just been a complete dud in these playoffs, pretty much. And Hood fits the versatility defensively and just gives them more size. Mm -hmm. And and uh, let's see here, who else? Who else could they, that? I'm Corver. Ultimately. What I think we're going to see happen is because, you know, they have Corver's been like their second best player, you could argue. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that ultimately they see that the, Cleveland doesn't have enough two way players. Right. Golden State is based off two way players, guys that can defend and get you offense. And mm -hmm. Cleveland just doesn't have enough of those guys. They kind of have to pick and choose lineups and try to mix and match because Larry Nance Jr. was essentially acquired for this series. Mm hmm. 
he's kind of like a warrior killer. He's roofed KD, and he's just like a versatile, new-age big guy. But he's been in and out of the rotation. So I expect Larry Nance to play a lot more. But I think that ultimately, like I said, not enough two-way players. They kind of have to choose, do we have a defensive lineup out there or an offensive lineup? You can roll an all-defensive lineup out there, but then you're asking LeBron to give you 45 points. Mm -hmm. And... Ultimately, I think you're going to see Cleveland fall into the trap of rolling an offensive lineup out there, right? With with Corver, Jr., mm-hmm. Love, right? And you'll see Nance Jr. and Tristan Thompson on the bench, and they're going to mm-hmm. get caught in a, in trying to outscore the Warriors, which is, you know, yeah, definitely. That that seems like from a strategy standpoint, that seems like a very viable option because if you think about it. Um, whenever the Warriors were held to lower points, they're more susceptible to the strengths of the Cavs, their size and wearing them down. But if you're trying to outshoot them or outscore them, you need to kind of give up on that idea. It kind of reminds me of in chess, how if you're playing as black, ultimately they'll teach you, don't worry about beating white, either draw or just foil their plan. So if I was the Cavs and Ty- Tyron Lu, I would negate the idea of trying to outscore them. I would simply just muddy up the game and make it very uncomfortable for them and, and wear them down. And that's easier said than done. A lot of people have tried it and not been successful. But whenever Houston was able to use some of their big bodies and relentless defense, you know, it, it was helpful at, at key times. And, and LeBron is pretty good in the final minutes. So if they could potentially muddy it up a bit, they'd have a better chance than trying to fight fire with fire. I, I, I don't trust J.R. Corver is kind of sporadic. Clay's always going to be on. Well, not always, but he's shown more recently he's going to be on. So I wouldn't try and outscore them. I would try and bloody them up and um, muddy the game up some with some tough defense. Using the full roster, piecemealing people in there, using that athleticism, if I was a Cavs. But. Yeah, it's. I think that that's – I will say this, and I was – this is something that is being presumed. We take for granted Draymond Green's durability. Mm-hmm. And I saw somewhere where I think he led that last series in like rebounds, assists, blocks, mm-hmm. and steals. Something mm-hmm. ridiculous, as mm-hmm. well as minutes played. And mm-hmm. that goes for both, both rosters. And mm-hmm. he rolled his ankle in that game seven. I believe it's the right ankle. Mm-hmm. And he said he just played through the adrenaline. And if you if you know he he struggled. I I had brought up his lack of confidence offensively, and the toll of of trying to take on the bigger Capella. That mm-hmm. he I mean look at the series he's, that he's played. He had to guard Lamarcus Aldridge, Anthony Davis, and then Clint Capella, mm-hmm. all guys where he's just giving up massive amounts of athleticism and size. And so, in, if you if you were to ask like the question of, and what crazy scenario would have to happen for the Cavs to like make this a series? I would answer you that if Dray, like if Draymond Green just wasn't Draymond Green in the series. <laughs> and the question being like, what's his battery level at? We know he'll play through the sprained ankle, but his battery is running lower than any other warrior right now. Mm-hmm. That That's how I'm reading it. And so that being said, the, the low key, now I won't call it a savior, but I guess maybe the surprise for the warriors One has been Kavon Looney throughout these playoffs, so I'm no longer calling that a surprise. We kind of saw that coming towards the tail end of the regular season. But Jordan Bell emerged in in this Houston Rockets series. Yeah, I like him. Right? He's fearless. He's ultra aggressive. And him and Looney are kind of like contrasting styles, right? Because Looney, it's like playing it safe. He's not going to mess up, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to play his role, but he's not really going to make any plays either. Mm-hmm. And Jordan Bell, he may fuck up three or four times, but he might make five or six plays. Mm-hmm. And I like him. I like him when it's wartime, when it's time to go chest to chest. Oh, yes. And it's He's getting about chippy. that lifestyle. I, you can see it on his face. You can also see, I, I mean, it's just kind of a causal guess, but I would bet that him and, and um, Saggy would be good friends. Just something about it. I see they, them kicking it real hard together. Like, I think they're on the same stilo. Like, I think they would really get along nicely. And I, and I got to give a kick out to to Young. He definitely came in. He looked, do you hear about that dream he had supposedly about how Rodman visited him in his dream and told him his defense should improve? It was a crazy he, story. He's something else, man. He's something <laughs> else. Because did you notice in the same breath, Rodman told him, oh, you, you're, you're going to play better defense. And he was like, nah, defense? I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> Even in a dream. But, Dang, yeah, this was resistant. <laughs> right? But he, I'll give him credit, man. He's proved that he can be out there in those moments. 
Yes, he can. Because it's it's not necessarily fundamental, but the, I saw the effort that I needed to see from him, like just the physicality, second and third efforts, and mm -hmm. not afraid to just mix it up, man. Hey, I, I wanted to get your idea, too, when you're speaking about Jordan Bell, when they run that uh, play through him where he basically just sets that screen, is able to screen off two people, throw between the legs like Zaw used to, and um, Curry's able to get to the corner three. That's very effective. Like it works like clockwork, just as long as he can maintain the handle and get it where it needs to go. They were killing, um, they were killing him on that, the Rockets. Right. It was something we saw that in the regular season a bit, and then they went away from it. It was almost like uh, they were like, "All right, let's put that in. Let's put that in our back pocket, and we'll mm -hmm. we'll reveal it some t at some point later." Mm -hmm. Right. And it and it's and it's basically you have Looney and Bell in that fifth spot in the death lineup, and obviously they're non shooters. But what they're doing is they're like, all right, well, they're not guarding him, so we'll just use them as a screener. And then using the dimensions of the court, right, that corner really puts the defense in a bind. Like you've got, you've either got to jump that or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's either going to leave the lane wide open or you're going to have to yield that, man. So I expect to see some of that. Another thing I'll say, I don't know, maybe this is just my bias, but I, I had mentioned this to you before. For whatever reason, it seemed like the Western Conference Finals – was just played at a different level of physicality than the Eastern Conference Finals. Mm -hmm. the, right? That like, game, yeah. That game seven was relatively lackluster. It was kind of like there wasn't a lot of emotion. It was, it was, I don't know. I, it, it's, it, it, it's what it, I mean, it's all, I, I, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So, I mean, if you're a Celtics or Cavs fan, I'm sure it was super intense. But me watching it objectively, I guess it's not objectively because I had picked the Celtics. I, mm -hmm. And Marcus Smart brought some physicality. Um, I liked what I saw from Larry Nance, but overall, it just felt a little less chippy and the intensity was a little less physical. How mm -hmm. is this memory card, fool? Let me, let me, uh, yeah, so I guess that doesn't matter because I have this up, man. Memory card, fool, I deleted that. That's wild. Let me see here. All right, well, I guess I'm looking the wrong way. It doesn't matter. Um, all right, well, let's keep it moving here with this. Uh, some some points for the Warriors, I thought, also were that Sean Livingston's been underwhelming. And I've mm -hmm. kind of given him a pass. My patrons were kind of uh, clowning that, you know, because I'll have in my patron, my extended videos, I'll have like kind of a theme where I pick on a player for the game. If there's someone <laughs> that I'm upset at, you know, and I'll go, I'll mm -hmm. point a little bit extra about what they did that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And Sean has kind of uh, missed my wrath. <laughs> Maybe just because, you know, he's he's just, what is he, like the, the seventh or eighth member on this team? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's just, you know, he, I just don't, I guess I don't have that high expectations for him. But, like, defensively, he's not maybe as good as what his reputation suggests, especially, like, on the ball. I think he's a good team defender. But, like, on the ball, he kind of dies on screen. He kind of has some of the problems that we've seen Steph have in the past where just not physical enough and kind of dying on screens. And if this series somehow turns big and it's turned into a big series and on the terms of like Cleveland, how Cleveland wants to play, it'll be interesting to see if Livingston, if he's just not in the mix. Now, is Iguodala, there's so many variables, but I'm just saying Bell has proven he can play. Looney's obviously in the rotation. And I think there's a good possibility that we could see a JaVale McGee or even, dare I say, a Zaza, because Zaza... If, if those of you that remember, he's, he was kind of a Tristan Thompson neutralizer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just, it, there, there's just a, there's a lot of uh, the benches, like on paper, people will say, well, Cleveland's deeper. But if you look at the stats, the Warriors bench, I think, believe statistically has been like the best in the playoffs. And okay. the problem being was that usually it's a guard friendly bench with the depth. And, and now it, it, that we have like three centers. Mm -hmm. and, and then and you could, and then you could throw Bell into the mix. So if it is if they if the, the series could somehow shift big, like I said, and then it would be interesting to see which team's depth pay, pays off more because you're looking at Nance Jr., Tristan Thompson, Kevin Love, Jeff Green, and then you've got Zaza. Well, Zaza's probably on the back end of that, but Javale, Jordan Bell, Kavon Looney, and then again Draymond Green. I don't know if he can play 45 minutes in this series, man. I think he may have spent most of what he can spend like th in, in these first three rounds of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I might contest that. 
I think if he's if he's if you're saying that he has naturally used his adrenaline in big moments and he's just been that consistent, you know, the numbers don't lie. He's going to find a way to make it happen. And I know you tend to yield on the side of caution, but I'd like to believe what I like about him is just whenever the ball is in the air, just his focus, like watch the way he watches the ball, like into his hands is different than other people. His his spatial relations and not even just fundamental boxing out is just he's very great at targeting the ball. You said he used to play tight end, right? Or something like that. Or I he, believe he, he was a football a, player. He was I think it was like 320 when he yeah, walked on to Michigan State. Big. I don't think yeah, he walked but, on, but but yeah, I like the way that he um, eyes the ball. He, he's got a good feel for it. But I do need him to step into his passes a little bit, be a little bit more aware if they're going to run stuff through him. But that's just you know you'll you'll deal you'll live with that, like you said. But that is going to be very important. You don't want to just be giving points away at this time. I don't care who you are. It's not advantageous to leave yourself open for you know. Don't let people even think they have a chance with you. But if you start slipping up people's confidence you can raise that can that can change the whole game like you know turnovers definitely and, and being inconsistent with what you're trying to do yeah i uh, back to jay i was looking at jr smith has he's just so hit or miss right but looking at his minutes throughout these playoffs they've played him like heavy minutes man in part mm-hmm. just because clarkson's been such trash mm-hmm. um we haven't even talked about george hill now George Hill has the reputation as a defender, but here's the difference. And, and he is. He's a decent defender. He's not going to make a lot of mistakes. He's a guy that uses his length. He has a crazy mm-hmm. long wingspan, right? And mm-hmm. he's not necessarily that physical. And we've seen in the past is with Steph that it's usually the physical guys that get into him that bother him. Mm-hmm. So I, I just think that I don't think George Hill is going to bother Steph as much as we've seen some other guys that kind of dig in and get more physical. And I also think in the, the the last quarter and a half of that game seven, I think Steph found something. I think he found mm-hmm. some sort of rhythm, and it was in his dribbling. It was in his ball handling. All of a sudden, he had that that pattern behind the back, and his dribble mm-hmm. was just a little harder, and it was a little more uh, confident. And mm-hmm. I think if he carries that in, man, I think he he may be due for his best NBA Finals. We talked about injury, what what Draymond's battery le- battery level is at, right? Well, Steph. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. could be just entering like the perfect rhythm and yes, freshness. Sir. He had yes, so sir. much time off. You're exactly right. And we, as not seasoned professionals from a medical standpoint, or people who are like Draymond, who can just push through with adrenaline, you were talking about your hamstring, and I've been talking about my knee and just whatever it might be. But perhaps just from a sheer diagnostic standpoint, his injury to his knee and, and, and ankle, maybe this is the time at which it truthfully is healing. You know, they always give us these preemptive time frames to make it sound good. But like you said, like if we're going to be honest about it, he had a long rest. And maybe now he's still working into something. We've all been there where you go to the gym and your body suddenly locks up before you walk inside because your body knows it's about to go through hell. So maybe he has kind of surpassed that position and now he's feeling loose, feeling good, back to normal. We tend to forget how hampering an injury is because you're playing against yourself and somebody else. Just imagine if you could just play against somebody else and you know you're better than them. That's when you find your, your quickness. Whenever you're like, oh, okay, I got this. But it just sucks whenever you're injured because it's you versus yourself and somebody. So that's why I always laud those who play those separated shoulder games or whatever. Maybe one crazy thing. I know it's off topic, but remember that that homie um, Chris Sims from UT, the the uh, quarterback. I guess he got hit so hard that a rib pierced his spleen and he literally almost died on the field. He lost like tons of blood or whatever, but nobody talks about it. So he seriously had one of the worst injuries on the field around so yeah his spleen was pierced and he basically was like bleeding to death internally kind of crazy the football culture's on some next level shit man but yeah it, uh, <laughs> but, and, and even like the in, the injury it, it's uh, like i've gone back and forth all through the playoffs since he came back is it in his head is it his body it is but beyond the injury just even like his body peaking these guys are such fine-tuned athletes mm-hmm. you have to uh, and maybe i'm wrong maybe there's somebody that hasn't played a lot throughout these but if you look at these finals matchups between the star players right Steph Curry hasn't played that much basketball this year. Like, (laughs) what game is this of his? We know, I remember seeing LeBron, it was his 100th game of the season, right? And he Mm -hmm. played 48 minutes, Mm -hmm. right? Steph, 
Steph played like 50 some regular season games, right? He missed the entire first round. So I'm just I'm just saying we could you could see a super a supercharged Steph Curry in these finals with George Hill where he just doesn't have that dog in him. Like he's he's a smart defender, he has the physical attributes. He's just not that physical. And then we're seeing, you know, it was hilarious where I, I, like Clay last night with the two fouls, I was rewatching that. He basically punked Kerr out of that. He he, <laughs> he was literally like no, I'm not. And he just turned around and didn't even look at him again. Kerr really had no option in the matter. And and so what we're, we're seeing, we've heard like China Clay and, you know, all these like these these adaptations of Clay. I think we're seeing Alpha Clay. Yeah. Like, I, I, and you speak of Alpha and you think of Alpha Dog. Shout out to Clay's dog, Rocco. I guess the team gets him on his birthdays a lot of Rocco um memor memorabilia he's had a cake he really loves his dogs clay he's a real smooth cat man i'm a big fan of clay's i think i'm gonna try and pick you up a pair of the what are they they it starts the with antas. the antas the yeah, antas and they're, they're nicely priced i got much respect for them like i would get some antas i'm gonna get you some too you were a 14 right Thir 13. 13 13 okay yeah man but they're fresh and you know i, I like them they're decent yeah, but yeah, yeah, Clay is relatively alpha. Like um, he did punk that fool because he kind of gave him the cutthroat type sign that you give somebody on some. Oh, shut the hell up! I'm not about to do that. So he definitely <laughs> was very aggressive about the fact that he had got it. Right. It was, and the third foul it was all on him. But like I said, in the heat of the moment, because it's funny how when you watch something live and you're so invested, you don't see things clearly. And I think we know this, but even you can know it. Like I'll go into the game knowing, like, oh, I'll, I'll get, I'll get emotional and I'll be seeing things kind of crazy. But in the moment, you still can't help yourself. But mm -hmm. yeah, rewatching it, it was like Clay kind of punk Curry. He was like, no, 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 f mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But I think that given the fact that I think we've seen in the past, and again, there's so much familiarity with this series, I think we're going to see Alpha Clay just wreck J.R. Smith. I think he's going to fucking wreck him. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's, you know, J.R. will have moments where he hits some incredibly tough shots. But just overall, I think I think Clay's confidence and, and, and just he, he's, he's really, like Kerr had said, in the prime of his career. I, this is just not a lot of ways. Like I said, you got to look at the only way I see Cleveland staying in this series is if Iguodala and Draymond just can't give the Warriors, you know, much. That's mm -hmm. that's how I see it, man. Mm -hmm. And I want to propose, I know they're talking about the death lineup and the Hampton Five and all that. I want to propose the Three Kings lineup. I think that that really is relatively accurate. No disrespect to Draymond. He's definitely there. But I think it's more of a Three Kings type scenario, either rather from the biblical standpoint with the frankincense, myrrh, and gold, or from they had, they had all these chess illusions or whatever. And they're talking about how there were different queens and this and that. But don't forget it. The king is the most important um, piece on the chessboard. Although it's the most limited, it makes all the, the choices. It's the general. You are the king. So I think that when it comes down to it, I might propose a three kings lineup. Not sure how accurate it is, but I think you have three grand masters, Clay, Steph, and Durant running the general, the, the floor generals. And I guess, uh, I'm not sure what that would make Draymond. He'd be like the bishop or the rook. But either way, I, I'm proposing a three kings um, vantage point. Well, I'll tell you what, man. It may it, if they would have lost that that game last night, you might have had two kings. You might have had. <laughs> I, I mean, like there will be wholesale changes. Yeah. Or they would have been. <laughs> um, and there still may be. Now I'm going to save some of that. We need to just get through these finals and see. But I think we're going to have a very interesting off season. One thing that kind of had me shook up was I'm always I'm always negative, and I, I've learned to like not get over negative during the games. But did you see Kerr? I've never seen Kerr that shook when he uh, it was like a out of a timeout, and he was mm -hmm. like, if we can just play how we're supposed to play, and then he just booked real mm -hmm. quick. I've never seen him that on edge during mm -hmm. one of those little like interviews. Yeah, he was looking real red. I don't know. And I wonder what the condition of his health is as well. Stress can definitely re bring things back. You know, that's a huge assertion to make. But yeah, he was just looking mad red and kind of sunburned and discomforted. <laughs> like it was kind of right. crazy. Well, and, and it was brought up. I think it was Bill Simmons that brought it up. Like there are certain th if you watch a lot of the coaches stand at the coaches box at the hash right during mm -hmm. the game and, and can better communicate call timeouts late in games and kind of communicate when things get disrupted and Kerr I'm guessing because of his health I, he wasn't much of a stander even before that um, mm -hmm. in his first season but he I, he has to sit down or he stays seated right and mm -hmm. there's moments where it, it benefits you greatly as a coach to be at the hash yes either to get a timeout or to just re-communicate something and you see that with 
a lot of the coaches. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, man, we'll see. We'll see if, you know, moving forward again, one thing I want to talk about, I, I didn't talk about with LeBron was that he has become a shooter. Mm -hmm. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, like literally he, he's like, I would classify him as a shooter. Now, now the defense isn't where it used to be give and take. And as his career has gotten older and what his team is needed from him, but he basically you, that shot where he, he goes left and it's all sorts of weird angles. He can go off glass or mm -hmm. he just loves mm -hmm. the little, um, you know, off the left leg, one legged fade away that he's developed. Mm -hmm. And then again, from that left coaching hash, from that hash in that left corner, if he has the ball, that's his zone where it, it's going to be a step back three, and he's become extremely accurate with it. And I think I, I, I don't see what I've suggested of him like going all in on defense. I just don't see it. I don't see him doing that, that strategy. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see the same strategy from LeBron where – we're going to see like 40 and 50 point games from him and he'll mm -hmm. get, and, 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 and maybe it's, this is just his decision where he's like, I'd rather just get the kind of personal glory of those big numbers mm -hmm. thinking he can't win either way. Mm -hmm. But I just, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. see, you know what I'm saying? But yeah. I, I think that I don't think we're going to see him digging in. The problem with that is, is once again, that it, it's, it's so simple. It doesn't, the more I think about it, like I understand he's got, he has to do so much, but it's like, if you were, if you told a 10 year old, right, if we, if you, when one of the kids we coached or, or taught, right, if you said, all right, here, here are all the Cleveland players, here's the Cleveland five <laughs> players, and here are the Warrior five players. I'm not joking, mm -hmm. 10, 10, mm -hmm. you know, a 10 year old. And mm -hmm. you say, pick who guards who, mm -hmm. right? Wouldn't mm -hmm. they, they'd go, okay, well, LeBron and, and KD. Yes. Right. It, sometimes it's, it gets overthought, and I just don't see him doing that. And what I think is going to happen is I think we're going to see him take plays off and pace himself for his offense and that system that warrior system is going to eat them the fuck up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's, what, yeah, that's what it is it's tough to do it all and then you have to kind of sit back on that personal glory well at least i had 45 y'all niggas was the ones who weren't playing defense <laughs> you know you can mm -hmm. kind of guard your self-worth and self-esteem you know so there's always that aspect of it too so you're right he's Gonna have to preserve his body his mind and he's you know relatively big egotist so you don't get it twisted at the end of the day you know he wants to preserve that too so we'll see how it how it pans out also on piggybacking off of that someone made an interesting thing i was listening on the radio about how we're giving lebron all this credit for working with this jumbled mess of people and personnel and all this and that but if you think about it he created that situation he is kind of the reason as a general manager lebron has not been that successful so he can't complain about yeah i'm dragging these tired bodies this far well it's kind of your choice to have brought people in and done A, B, and C. So now the, the, the actual illusion that they made was, say somebody comes into work hungover, you're not gonna congratulate them for making it through the day. You're probably gonna be like, yeah, you performed, you, you made the deal, but don't come in smelling like booze. So you're not always gonna congratulate somebody for you know making it through all this adversity if they created it themselves. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. There's. It, he he's and we were just talking about this before we got on about like the issues you had brought up. Was it Jerry Colangelo and, and yeah, some of the some sneaky of the sneaky fool, <laughs> right? And so there's just so much more to today's sports world with social media. And LeBron is really like the godfather of controlling the narrative. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, and I don't, you know, I, at the risk of being cocky, and I've just gone you know, learning to do. I don't even want to go through like complete predictions and stuff like that. But or being I don't want to sound overconfident as a Warrior fan, but I think that rather than the series like being extended and pushed and in, in, in danger, mm -hmm. I think that an, a more realistic scenario or interesting thing could be is like LeBron. Uh, I'm, <laughs> so did you see when he thought he hurt his knee? Mm, I, don't, did you I see have any? seen him be dramatic, but no, I haven't seen that. So I think it was Larry Nance came down on his knee and it looked very similar to like what happened to Iguodala or mm -hmm. even Duran a few years ago with Zaza, mm -hmm. except the only problem was LeBron's knee didn't budge. So, you know, like when someone hits your knee or your leg and, mm -hmm. it, and you see a buckle, you know, like mm -hmm. whenever you're looking for, when someone goes down and they replay it, you're looking for the buckle, right? Yeah. Whether it's at the ankle, the knee, at some one of the joints. And so he goes down <laughs> and he lays there like, I think he puts his hand on his face. He's like, oh, 
oh my God, right? He lays down for a good five seconds and then he gets up with no weight on the leg. Mm -hmm. Like he's like literally hopping. And then mm -hmm. he hops for like four or five times and then he realizes, oh, wait a minute, nothing fucking happened to my knee. <laughs> and like, I mean, it, it was pretty bad. It was D-Wade level. It was D-Wade level. And, and it just, it's just funny because like you take a guy like Draymond where I'm doing my editing for the, the game seven, I couldn't find where he sprained the ankle. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I couldn't find mm -hmm. it. Like he said, his adrenaline took over and he just mm -hmm. wasn't going to accept that he had, that he hurt his ankle. So he just kept playing. Mm -hmm. And that was like the mindset of his, like, I need to be out here. We need this game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, maybe I'm reaching here a little bit. And yes, I'm a LeBron hater. I'll, I'll gladly wear that. But he, it, to me, it was almost like there was a part of him that wanted to the need he to be injured because he was just like fuck i need to get out of this like i <laughs> this is too much he's and i almost don't blame him right like he's having to do too much i don't th i think at his core he knows like he can't win it all mm -hmm. and i'm just i'm just be interested to see if this gets ugly and it's you know game mm -hmm. three and it's 2-0 mm -hmm. and the warriors are up 16 mm -hmm. in cleveland mm -hmm. like will he get will he need to go to the locker room for an iv or yeah well you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. i think that's a much more likely scenario of lebron looking searching for a bailout in this series mm -hmm. and again controlling the narrative of he's got to leave like if they make if cleveland takes this to six or seven games somehow that's hard. I mean, Lamont can do whatever the fuck he wants, right? But mm -hmm. isn't that a harder sell of I got to go somewhere else? Well, well, you know, when you you mean for him or for who? Because you yeah, know, for, good well, for LeBron. For, for so like if he if he wants to go okay. to Los Angeles or Houston or Philadelphia, if this okay. series goes six or seven, what can he when he has the announcement three or whatever the fuck he wants <laughs> to call it? Mm -hmm. What what can he say? Well, you know, I just do. It's my new chapter and. I didn't have enough or you know what I'm saying? Like if you're mm -hmm. one or two games mm -hmm. away from another ring. You're right. That that does give you more scrutiny. However, I'd put it just on simple terms. Like if you just ended a relationship and you're out there and somebody invites you to this new club and you're thinking about options, I, they, what is it they say? What's stronger, a million dollars now or the propensity of five million in a year? So, I mean, I think it's just that expectancy. So you're right. If he does make it to six or seven. But I think once you've had enough, you've had enough. Like if this, if he's really like, man, forget this organization. I did what I needed to do. F y'all fools. Like that's more than enough. Like you'll leave some cheese on the table <laughs> for that. So it just depends on how, how, how happy he is there. But, you know, he might want to change. He, he could potentially go to another team and bring them up too. And that's definitely big for him. So that might be the next thing on the mantle. Like, can I go somewhere else and do it? I'm not sure if there's been people who've been on three separate squads and um, brought them to championship level but yeah, that's a very good question if he takes the distance what recourse does he have to say oh i didn't have enough but i would just say you know once you've chosen you're tired of this relationship it'll be nothing to leave right yeah he i mean he has shown the ability to it, it, he could win and leave right like <laughs> I'm, I'm just i'm just saying if there's that like if 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 things go as everybody expects right and they're mm -hmm. down and it doesn't and it doesn't look like there's a lot of hope mm -hmm. right would I, yeah. I just i just expect to see some theatrics mm -hmm. where it's like mm -hmm. remember the cramp game in san antonio yes and, and, Ooh, you know how i feel about that pop right, did it but right either way <laughs> right no and there, that was mm -hmm. there's real life i'm just saying could could like like <laughs> what if and I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm knocking on wood i don't care i gotta say what i say this is I've, this i gotta remain but like let's say that there's a, a sweep on the table it's game four right mm -hmm. and they're down 15 and it, it, it's it's <laughs> it's happening right what if lebron just collapses in exhaustion <laughs> like you know he scored he scored 48 points per, per game in the series right. and he's done he's done and like <laughs> I, I, mean, I think that's more likely than it going six or seven uh, i'm just saying man and again i don't I've, I've said this i've spoken on this before that's the that's the one catch with me covering my squad mm -hmm. is i can't give you all unbiased opinions or mm -hmm. objective mm -hmm. opinions you know mm -hmm. of course like i'm you know taking shots at lebron during this mm -hmm. but i just call it how i see it and what i think may happen <laughs> <laughs> it's real funny
Um, but yeah, man, I think I, I think we I think we covered this this finals preview. For those of you that are just checking this out, this is a podcast. We try to get it weekly or by you know every two weeks, and we're gonna be moving through the summer and covering the off season and all that stuff. I encourage y'all to check it out on iTunes, Google Play, and uh, you know I'll be back with uh, all the game reviews and keep it moving through the summer, man. I appreciate you, James. Yeah, definitely, man. Anytime. All right, y'all. We're out.